Hello everybody, Jeremy Dickinson here. Thank you all for watching. So in this video, I'm going to continue my discussion of Harry Frankfurt's 1971 essay, The Freedom of the Will and the Concept of a Person. And um, what I'm going to do is just pick up where I left off my previous video. So this will be part two of the video series on, on Frankfurt's uh, famous paper. So where I left off, um, let's maybe just do a bit of recap to situate things. Um, so we established, um, according to Frankfurt, what a second order of volition is. And the claim is, is that what's essential for a being to be a person is that they have second order volitions. Now, important to know that this is a necessary claim. It's not a sufficiency claim. So just because one has second order volitions doesn't mean that it's sufficient that they're a person. Okay. It's just going to be necessary that if, that, um, if one's a person, right, then one has the um, second order volitions. And remember, second order volitions are a kind of second order desire. So a second order desire is a desire about one's desires. Okay. Um, and, um, Remember that um, Frankfurt's account of the will involves um, defining it in terms of desires. It's going to be having desires um, that are effective. So having uh, effective first order desires, desires that are enough to get one to act. Okay, so in order to um, establish that, uh, or at least to show us in a clear way what it would mean to have second order volitions, Frankfurt uses the famous example of the unwilling addict. So by way of recap, we have this addict um, 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 who continually chooses to um, satisfy the desire that corresponds with taking drugs. Um, but he also has this conflicting first order desire. And that conflicting first order desire is to um, not take drugs. But he has a second order desire. So he has a desire regarding his desires. In this case, he has a conflict of desires, but he has a desire, second order desire, about which one um, he wants to be effective. And it turns out that he wants a desire um, to uh, not take the drugs to be effective. So that second order desire is a desire to um, have his desire not to take the drugs to be effective. Um, but of course, he's 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 narcotics addict, so he continues to choose the um, the first order desire that's associated with taking the drugs. This this is what makes this individual an unwilling addict. It's a second order of volition in this case because this individual, this unwilling addict, does care about his will. He cares that um, that he continues to choose the desire to take the drugs. He wishes, he, he wish, he wants to be such that he um, that he act on his first order desire not to take the drugs. So having um, um, a will structure such that you have the second order desires that um, um, that show a kind of care about which of your first order, order desires are effective. So what established a second order of volitions and Frankfurt's again claiming that was essential to a person's having second order of volitions. And this is not a, a sufficiency claim. So one's not a person um, just because one has second order volitions. You have to add necessary conditions before you'd have enough to get to a person. And so what does Frankfurt think um, we need to add? Well, this kind of allows us to expand it. At the end of my previous video, I noted that it has something to do with the free will. And so let's go ahead and pick up there now. So what Frankfurt wants to say that is, is um, um, necessary for being a person is having a free will. So it's another necessary condition um, that's in place here. So um, what he ends up claiming, um, um, perhaps more accurately, uh, in this regard, is that that a person um, essentially um, is such that um, she cares about the freedom of the will, or the freedom of the will is a problem for uh, for such an individual. So how do we define what a free will is? And Frankfurt claims here that there's been some confusion, perhaps some conflating going on between um, the concept of the free will and the concept of the free action. Uh, and he thinks that. Um, we can understand a free action just roughly as, um, as he puts it, acting in the way one wants to act. And he thinks that we can define what a free will is um, along those lines, but just making the appropriate changes where necessary. And he claims that having a free will is having the will one wants to have. So a free action, just to um, uh, drive this home, is acting in the way one wants to act. But having a free will is different. It's having the will one wants to act. Okay, so let's go back. Let's see if we can understand what it means to have a free will. Let's set aside the free action bit and focus on free will. Um, let's ask ourselves this question. Um, does the um, unwilling addict have a free will, according to Frankfurt? I'll take a pause here. Okay. Um, uh, the answer turns out to be no, right? Because 
Um, it turns out that the unwilling addict doesn't have the will that he wants to have. Why? Because he's always choosing um, the desire um, uh, that he, um, according to a second order desires, doesn't want to have satisfied. So he ends up choosing to take the drugs, despite the fact that his second order desire, his second order volition in this case, is to act on the desire that involves not taking the drugs. So he doesn't have the will that he wants to have. So the unwilling addict then isn't going to satisfy this necessary condition for being a person, which is going to be a being for whom um, one has the will that one wants to have. Okay, so um, hopefully we understand this idea of, of what it means to have a free will, according to Frankfurt. Um, so now we see sort of big picture uh, for Frankfurt, um, the connection between the concept of a person and the concept of, of free will. So um, there's going to be a necessary connection uh, between the two. So it's necessary that a person um, is such that um, they have a free will, at least to some degree or other. Frankfurt doesn't work these things out in perfect detail, but um, it's going to be having the will that one wants to have. Okay, so he's built up to this point here. And then what he thinks he needs to do is say some things about, um, about the issue of uh, moral responsibility. And why that's important, according to Frankfurt, is because many philosophers at least traditionally have been concerned with free will because they think that this idea of moral responsibility is is in the neighborhood they're concerned with establishing that we can be morally responsible for what we do and oftentimes that gets cashed out in different ways it gets cashed out generally in terms of you know you're to be blamed if you do that which is wrong right in some regard and you're to be praised for doing that which is right and we're talking about moral evaluations here so we're talking about moral wrongness and moral rightness and these are just very general characterizations, right? So if someone, for example, um, uh, tells you a lie, suppose it's a good friend of yours, tells you a lie, it seems like you'd want to say that they did, just all things being equal, something morally wrong, okay? So perhaps it was just a, a lie to save off embarrassment, but it was an important lie nonetheless. Um, in that case, we'd want to blame our friend for uh, telling us a lie. Now, what that involves may differ uh, in different, um, in different um, uh, uh, relationships, Right, but um, to blame someone just might mean something like you're 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 going to withhold some trust for a time um, regarding um, confiding in your friend and these kinds of things. Okay, just to give like a, a simple example, and of course, if you're um, if someone tells the truth in a situation and uh, does the right thing thereby, um, let's just suppose all things being equal, right? We're to, we can commend our, our our friend, for example, for telling us the truth uh, in such cases. So um, uh, it's it's oftentimes been take it for granted in the philosophical community that um, in order to uh, act freely, um, or sorry, in order to act in such a way that one's morally responsible, let's go that direction, then uh, one has to have a free will. Now we can set aside the issue of whether or not you um, have to have uh, the ability to perform free actions. Frankfurt um, deals with that a little bit, but we'll set that aside and focus on this idea of, of having a free will. And here's what Frankfurt wants to claim. Frankfurt wants to claim that one can be morally responsible um, for something, for, for um, performing an action, right? Even if they didn't have um, a free will, okay? So um, remember, free will, uh, having a free will, right? Is having the will that one uh, wants to have, right? Um, and so, um, or willing what one wants to will, Okay, to be put in that way, Frankfurt puts it that way in his paper as well. So um, uh, a moral responsibility, as it were, then on Frankfurt's who doesn't require having free will. And in this way, he breaks with some traditional views, um, 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 a, great, a great deal of them, as it turns out. So why uh, does Frankfurt think that this is the case? Well, he gives us the example of not the unwilling addict this time, but the example of the, um, uh, uh, sorry, not the example of the unwilling addict, but the example the example of the willing addict. Okay, hopefully that was clear. Um, in order to give us uh, an example of, of someone who can be morally responsible for doing something without having a free will, he gives us an example of the willing addict. You find the page here. So this is on page... Um, This is on page 19 of the Frankfurt, if you're following along here. So um, this follows uh, a, a fairly confusing discussion uh, on, from pages 17 to 19. Um, we'll, we'll skip some of the complications there. It turns out it's an important discussion, but I want to cut to the chase here. 
um, and focus on um, um, what he's going to claim about the willing addict and why he thinks the willing addict um, uh, is morally responsible but doesn't have a free will. Uh, sorry for the delay there. My screen went blank for a minute, uh, and I don't know why. So uh, anyways, I'm back. Uh, so uh, here's what Frankfurt claims. I'll read the case. So an illustration, an illustration of um, an example of a case where um, a person is more than responsible but lacks free will would be the following. Consider, he says, consider a third kind of addict. Suppose that his addiction has the same physiological basis and the same irresistible thrust. Um, as the addictions of the unwilling and the wanton addicts. So um, the wanton addict is going to be an addict that, um, uh, that uh, um, like the unwilling addict, always chooses um, the desire to act on the desire to take the drugs, but doesn't care about um, his will, um, doesn't care about which of his first order desires is effective. The way Frankfurt describes the wanton addict is whatever desire is, as it were, um, the strongest is going to be the one that the wanton acts for. And so um, in that case, it just turns out that the, um, the desires connected with taking the drugs in accordance with the addiction right, are um, the same uh, for the wanton addict as um, the, the strength of the desires in the case of thinking about the unwilling addict. So here we have the case of the willing addict. Um, so everything is the same. There's this perpetual taking of the drugs Right, in line with the desire to take the drugs, that first order desire. But the second willing addict is going to turn out to have um, second order desires. And um, here's what he claims. Um, so uh, um, here's what he claims. But, uh, but what's true about the willing addict, um, in, dis in contradistinction from the case of the unwilling addict, um, uh, the unwilling addict is altogether delighted with his condition. Okay. So remember, the unwilling addict, he's, he's, he's struggling with his condition. The willing addict isn't. He's delighted with the fact that he's addicted to, um, to the drugs. So he claims he's a willing addict. He would not have things any other way. So it's supposed to be just kind of like a possible case, right? A case where we have an addict who um, is content being an addict. As he claims again, he's willing. He's a willing addict who would not have things any other way. If the grip of his addiction would somehow weaken, then he would do whatever he could to reinstate it. So it turns out that he's not going to have to reinstate his first order desire being effective or the first order desire being powerful enough to get him to act on the basis of it to take the drugs. Okay, but were, right, hypothetically, um, his his desire to take the drugs at the first order level, level were they to weaken, he would take action to uh, strengthen uh, his first order desire to take the drugs. So he does, this individual, he does care about his, his uh, first order desires. He cares that his desire to take the drug be effective. So in this case, he doesn't have just second order desires full stop. He doesn't have just mere second order desires, that we, as I called them in the previous video. But he also has second order, you've got a second order volitions. Okay. So he, he claims, again, if the grip of his addiction would somehow weaken he would do whatever he could to reinstate it. If his desire for the drug uh, should begin to fade, he should. He would take steps. He would take steps to renew its intensity, whatever that may involve. Um, so he claims the willing addict's will is not free. It's not free because um, he 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 constantly he always takes um, acts on the desire for the sake of. Um, taking the drugs, right? He always, he's always acting on that first order of desire. So the willing addict's will is not free. He doesn't have the will that he wants, just almost by definition, because he's an addict. Okay, but here's what Frankfurt claims. Intuitively, we would think of such an addict, this willing addict, that he's morally responsible, right? And we think that he's morally responsible because, here's Frankfurt, were he to not act on the first order of desire to take the drugs, given that he cares about which of his first order, first order desires is effective, he would do whatever he could to make sure that, that first order desire were effective to take the drugs. Okay, so Frankfurt's challenging um, a dominant view here, again, by, by, by ch uh, challenging the claim, denying the claim that moral responsibility requires having a free will. Okay, so Frankfurt, he, he, um, he took on some heavy-duty issues in his uh, Freedom of the Will and Concept of Person paper, 
Thank you all for watching. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.